Let's get going. Let's get it on. Our first speaker leading batting leadoff is Brian Miller of Ackerman Center Fitz, Miami, Miami office. He is the chair of the firm's securities litigation practice. Brian's practice concentrates in securities class action defense, internal investigations, accounting fraud, and director's fiduciary duties. Brian has defended more than 20 shareholder class actions involving allegations of securities fraud, accounting fraud, and breach of fiduciary duty, collectively seeking damages in excess of $1 billion, with a B, dollars. He has also defended numerous SEC investigations. Brian will speak to you about the risks associated with unregistered finders who engage in broker-dealer activities. Please welcome Brian Miller. Thank you, John. Uh, good morning, everybody. One of the more interesting trends that I see lately is a rise in actions involving unregistered finders, whether it's the SEC bringing enforcement actions against finders or private litigation, disgruntled investors who invested in a product that did not deal with a registered rep but instead dealt with a finder who want to try to seek rescission of that and you're dealing with the civil litigation or the company may be dealing with claims for rescission even though it wasn't the person who received the commission from the unregistered broker. Um, I'm not exactly sure why this is. I think perhaps part of the reason is that you have a lot of people who may be leaving the financial industry, former CFOs, people in between financial jobs, people who've been in the investment field, private equity, hedge funds, and while they, of course, need to earn a living, one way they come up with, based on their connections, is to engage in finder activities without necessarily being registered. That's just my theory for why perhaps we see an increase in that. Part of it also may be that we have a lot of do-it-yourself attitude with the internet and people able to do things that they couldn't do by themselves previously, like publish a book, for example. So I think you see a lot of people saying, let's cut out the financial institutions and try to raise this capital ourselves. We'll go out, we'll get people to find the capital for us, and we'll pay them a commission. So those are perhaps some of the reasons why we see this trend. But whatever the reasons are, we have to deal with them. I wanted to speak, uh, first of all, about the law that applies here. We're talking about finders. A finder is a very broad firm, but basically it could be a business broker, it could be a securities broker, it could be somebody who is a true finder who just makes a one-time introduction of person with money to person who needs money. Um, these are all broadly defined as finders. The most important thing to remember about a finder is that there really is no definition. There's a definition of what is not a finder, but there really is no definition of what is a finder. Now, what is not a finder is a broker. So as you, as the audience in this room knows well, there are broker-dealer uh, registration requirements. There are requirements under federal law. There are requirements under state law. And there also may be requirements under state real estate and other laws that require licensure that people don't necessarily think about. First, um, federal securities registration. As you probably know, the term broker and dealer are defined in the Securities Exchange Act of 1934. Section 3A4 defines a broker essentially as somebody who engages in the business of effecting securities transactions for the account of others. This probably goes without saying, but registration as a broker under the federal securities laws only applies to somebody who brokers securities. That's the jurisdictional hook that the securities laws have. So if you're brokering a sale of assets, for example, rather than a sale of securities, then obviously registration as a broker would not be required. Um, Section 15 requires brokers to register with the SEC. As um, you also know, FINRA requires registration of registered reps who are associated with a broker-dealer. And there are various um, series licenses that FINRA has. The SEC looks at three key areas to determine whether somebody is engaged as a broker. First, does that person participate in important parts of the transaction, including soliciting the investment or negotiating the terms of the transaction? Second, and perhaps most important in the SEC's mind, does the person receive transaction-based compensation? 
So if you're receiving a commission, the SEC's position is automatically you are deemed a broker. The courts have various tests of anywhere between four, six, or eight factors that they look to to determine whether you're a broker that's required to register. Um, the SEC's view is that this second one on my list, receiving transaction-based compensation, is dispositive in itself. I'm not sure that the courts really agree with that, and when we argue these cases to the courts, uh, for example, in an SEC enforcement action, we will point to the number of factors that the court can consider, and there are cases saying that the court needs to look at these in totality rather than just look at transaction-based compensation in isolation. But that's probably a little consolation to your client or your insured or your friend or whoever it is who's already been sued by the SEC claiming that they're an unregistered broker. Uh, finally, the third key area that the SEC looks to is whether the person handles any securities or money as part of the transaction. If the person um, delivers the securities, if the person receives the cash uh, from the investor and conveys that to the company, the SEC is going to be much more inclined to view the person as a broker. And this is, I think, for obvious reasons, because the purpose of broker-dealer registration and regulation is to ensure, at bottom, that people don't steal money. So if you're involved in handling the money or handling the securities, there's obviously a much greater interest that the government has in regulating your conduct and making sure that you're not doing something to the disadvantage of the uh, client. Um, and as I said before, if the answer to any one of these questions is yes, particularly number two, the SEC will say that you are required to register as a broker. People often um, come to a lawyer like me when they've gotten into trouble for this, have been accused of being an unregistered broker, and they say, well, I'm not a broker, I'm a finder. As I mentioned before, there really is no definition of what a finder is. And it's probably rarer than, um, I don't know what, but think of the example of the cliche of something that's very rare and that's what a finder is. There's one um, no action letter the SEC issued which I put up on the screen, which is I think of particular interest, from 2006 called Country Business. In that case, the SEC actually did give no action guidance to somebody that he really was a finder. Um, that's pretty rare to see, but this is an example of the circumstances the SEC got comfortable with that. In that case, assets were being advertised for sale rather than securities. So as I mentioned before, the SEC only has jurisdiction over securities. If assets are being sold, then they don't have jurisdiction. But in this case, even though the person was advertising assets, in other words, um, you know, I'm selling a dry cleaning store or I'm selling some type of business, the compensation for the um, commission was negotiated at the time the person was advertising to sell these assets. But then the transaction was converted to be rather than a sale of assets to be a sale of stock. And that's where the no action guidance came in. The company in this particular example also was a small business under SBA guidelines. I don't think that Logically, that really has any bearing on the definition of whether one is a broker or not, but I think the SEC was more comfortable under these circumstances that there was some minimal SBA um, guidance on this company or some minimal SBA regulation on this company, and it was an effort to try to encourage capital raising for small companies who otherwise might have a difficult time accessing the capital markets. So that's one of the very few examples you will find where the SEC got comfortable that somebody was acting as a finder that didn't require registration as a broker or dealer. I don't think that um, you'll find many circumstances that fit within this kind of narrow definition. So most times when you have somebody who comes to you and claims to be an unregistered finder, you'll probably conclude that they are not really a finder. Um, I've also mentioned a couple of FINRA um, regulations here on this page. 
There is a Series 79 license for investment banking activities, such as buying or selling a business, rather than having to get a Series 7 or other licenses. I don't think that this um, has really been taken advantage of to a great extent, but that is something that FINRA put out as sort of a more limited license for somebody who's not really a broker, but is rather engaged in brokering businesses rather than brokering securities. And finally, um, FINRA Rule 1060 regulates payments to foreign finders who are brokers registered in another jurisdiction who are not registered in the United States. There are very specific requirements for when you can or cannot pay a finder's fee to that foreign unregistered broker. FINRA proposed some amendments to this rule a couple of years ago, but as of yet, those amendments have not gone anywhere. So that's something to keep an eye on, uh, particularly if you're with a uh, broker dealer where you do make payments to unregistered foreign broker dealers as finders under Rule 1060 from time to time. The second area of registration is um, state registration of brokers and dealers. Again, most states, um, probably all states, I haven't done a survey, but I'm sure they all require registration of brokers under state securities law. The definitions are generally the same as under the federal securities laws. Um, it's hard to generalize 50 states, but generally somebody who's in the business of offering or secure, uh, selling securities or affecting transactions and securities will be a broker. Most states have specific people who are excluded from that, attorneys working on a transaction, uh, CPAs involved are oftentimes excluded from state registration requirements. But that's something that um, particularly registered brokers will have to deal with as well to make sure that they're appropriately registered in whatever jurisdiction they're working in. The third category of licensure requirements is something that a lot of people don't really focus on or know about, and that is registration as a real estate broker or other type of broker. I've listed here some states that require people who are brokering businesses to register not only as a securities broker under the state's blue sky laws, but also to register as a real estate broker, which is very counterintuitive. And this often gets people in trouble when they engage in finder transactions. And as you can see, there are some fairly substantial states that require um, these registrations. Now, I'm from Miami, so I'm focusing for the moment on the Florida um, registration requirement. And I also focus on this because among the states that require real estate licensure, I think Florida is perhaps one of the most onerous and a place where people can really get in trouble, uh, particularly because, as I mentioned at the very beginning, we see a lot of former financial people, people from the industry who, surprise, often like to relocate to Florida from New York and they get in trouble for this sort of thing. Now under Florida statute section 47501, a real estate broker is defined as including brokering the sale, exchange, purchase, or rental of business enterprises or business opportunities. So it's defined broadly to include brokering a business, not just brokering a real estate. And this could be brokering a business that has no real estate assets whatsoever. It could be a completely virtual business that you're brokering, and still you would have to register as a real estate broker. Um, the interesting thing about this um, statute to me, and we often see, is that the commission contract, if you're acting as an unregistered real estate broker in Florida, is void. So if you're the company trying to raise capital, somebody's come to you, they offer you some money, and they want a commission from it, you could actually take their money and then refuse to pay them the commission because the entire transaction is void. We often see that kind of litigation where finders sue for their commissions and we say, sorry, you're a void, you're unregistered, you don't get your commission. So it's a good way for somebody to spend a lot of work trying to put a deal together and get absolutely nothing to show for it at the end. Um, also, it is a felony. I'm not sure I'm aware of any circumstances of anyone going to prison for being an unregistered real estate broker under these circumstances, but that's always a possibility as well. So obviously there are a lot of risks associated with um, finders and finders fees. Um, one thing I wanted to focus on here is the impact of 
unregistered finders on capital raising. If um, you're a company or you're representing a company trying to raise capital and you think that you're going to get a better deal or save some money or aggravation by using an unregistered uh, broker as a finder, there are often consequences that can come with that. Um, it goes far beyond registration. You could deal with somebody who doesn't really know what they're doing. You may not be able to raise the capital you think you're going to raise. Uh, there's uncertainty as to the fee obligation or commission obligation that you're going to pay to this person. There is certainly an increased risk of regulatory scrutiny on the transaction if you're working with an unregistered finder because the SEC may um, come after you as the issuer of the securities in addition to the finder. Um, also, surprisingly, we always see a high correlation between the use of unregistered finders and excessive commissions or excessive markups. I don't know why that happens, but oftentimes you'll find that you're paying way more than you need to if you're using somebody who's not regulated and governed by the um, commission schedule or FINRA rules on markups, for example. Then there's the risk of future litigation. Um, you may have litigation over whether you're entitled to pay that person a finder's fee because he or she was not registered. You may face rescission actions from investors if they submitted their capital through a finder, the business doesn't perform well. That's a very nice way to try to sue to rescind the entire transaction and get your money back if you can allege that there was an unregistered broker on the transaction. So there's a lot of risk involved in trying to use finders. I want to speak briefly about the um, things that we in this audience can try to do to deal with some of these risks and problems. Um, first of all, I'm not sure the um, top requirement applies so much to the audience in this room uh, who are either mostly dealing with in-house lawyers at registered broker dealers or perhaps um, insurance claims personnel who deal with broker dealer e and type claims. But if you're advising somebody who is on the issuer side or you're advising somebody who really wants to be a finder and can qualify as a finder, it's very important to document the agreement. Um, as I mentioned before, the second thing on my uh, bullet list, we see a high correlation between unregistered finders and excessive fees. So if you're dealing with an unregistered finder, it's particularly important to make sure that there's standard and customary fees being used. Um, you need to make sure that the incentives are properly aligned for the person who's raising capital for you, that they're not just out for their own pocket, but you're really um, working with somebody who has your interest in mind as an issuer trying to raise capital. There are confidentiality concerns because, again, you're dealing with somebody in an unregistered, unregulated context. And um, the last point I had on there is do not disperse finder's fees too early because you may be able to get out of paying them for one thing. Um, and you want to make sure that there are no claims or blowback from raising capital through a finder before you actually give them the money because, as you can imagine, once the money goes out, it's probably gone. Now, your um, preventive measures and how you deal with unregistered finders obviously can vary depending on what your role is. Uh, we have a lot of registered broker dealers in this room. To me, I think the most important takeaway from this is you have a competitive advantage over unregistered brokers. So if your um, registered reps or investment bankers are dealing with somebody who proposes to raise capital through an unregistered finder, you can point out some of these problems with using unregistered finders in order to give yourselves a real competitive advantage and try to get the business. If, um, God forbid, we have any finders in the room, first of all, I'd say to you, don't do it. You're probably not really a finder. Um, but your preventative measure would be to register. Um, advisors, attorneys who are dealing with people, you can use some of the points I've given you to advise companies trying to raise capital or people trying to be finders and let them know what they need to do and what they shouldn't do. Uh, the same goes for any buyers and sellers. Most likely, the people in this room are going to be advising buyers or sellers of businesses rather than actually doing that yourselves. And capital providers are well represented in this room. I think that's really the same advice that I gave at the beginning for registered broker dealers, which is focus on your competitive advantage through being registered and being regulated. 
So thank you very much for your time. Those are some of the highlights of the risks of dealing with unregistered finders.